Welcome everybody to the next session of Stanford's Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Seminar. Welcome the Stanford community and welcome to the broader public via YouTube. I'm Ravi Balani, a lecturer in the Department of Management Science and Engineering at Stanford and also the director of Alchemist and Accelerator for Enterprise Startups. Um, and this is presented, the Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Series is presented by STVP, the Entrepreneurship Center in Stanford's School of Engineering and BASIS the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students. Seldom, I think if ever, can have I been able to say that tonight's or today's talk would not be possible without our two speakers, because literally we're coming to you on the platform that was created and funded by our speakers. And I don't think that there is another product in 2020 that has become such a ubiquitous part of our lives as Zoom. And so we are incredibly honored for the time of Eric Yuan and Santi Subotovsky, um, who have joined us. Eric Yuan was one of the first 20 hires and VP of engineering at the video conferencing startup WebEx, which he joined in 1997. WebEx was then acquired a decade later by Cisco in 2007, where Eric became the VP of engineering. He then left Cisco in 2011 to launch Zoom, which I know we're all familiar with, but is now valued at $150 billion publicly and is one of the most valuable companies in the world. Santi Subotovsky is a general partner at Emergence Capital and he led the firm's investment in Zoom. Santi holds an MBA from the Stanford of the East from Harvard and a BS in economics from St. Andrews University in Argentina. Santi is not only a prescient investor, but he's also a founder at heart, having founded AXG, a SaaS e-learning company in Argentina before his days as a venture capitalist. And he's also a founding board member of Cuenta Labs and an organization that helps founders of high potential growth companies in Latin America scale their businesses globally. So please welcome me, uh, please welcome Eric and Santi to ETL. Eric and Santi, lots of virtual love for you guys. Um, gang, I wanna start off because I know that everybody knows um, Zoom now, and it feels like a foregone, foregone conclusion that Zoom is the phenomenon that it is. But back in 2011, that was not necessarily um, clear. And in fact, this is a story that even though it feels like it came out of nowhere, the reality is, is, is that Eric, um, you, started, um, uh, you started Zoom in 2011, you started WebEx, or you're part of one of the first 20 people at WebEx in 1997. And so really this started 23 years before today to get to this moment of where you're at today. Um, and I want to start then from those early days of starting Zoom, uh, because even though um, few people, I think, realize it, but at the time, um, starting another video web conferencing company in 2011 um, was like the classic thing not to do. And it was sort of the classic lesson of what a venture capitalist would not fund. You had Cisco had WebEx, um, Microsoft had acquired Skype, Google had Hangouts, um, prominent VC funds had funded companies like Blue Jeans Network. And there was consumer offerings like Facebook Live coming, and it was an intensely crowded space. And so I want to start from that moment in 2011, uh, when you're in this intensely crowded space. What was your intention when you started? Was the intention just to build another great product, or did you have a vision that was fundamentally different, where you wanted, to, where you're thinking about more than just a video product? Yeah. So Ravi, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I think the, you know, you just described the, the problem back then, right? I mean, market situation back in 2011. That's one of the key reasons. When I talk with uh, friends or investors, they say, wow, there's no way for you to put it out. Right? It's so crowded, there's so many other companies. But the way I look at this is, you know, you've got to understand one thing is, when you try to build something, why do you build that? It's not for your investors, for your friend, it's for end user. Because I spend a lot of time talking with uh, every friend, everyone I know, and uh, no matter which solution they were using back then, I always ask, ask them, do you like that solution? I did not see a single user told me that, I really enjoy this and that. No. Then I realized, wow, if that's the case, I might have uh, a chance. If I can build something better, at least that can survive, right? That's the reason why I dared to start. And uh, yeah, that's how I started, so. 
Well, and I love that because, you know, there is this mantra these days that don't go after what's called red ocean waters that are shark infested. Go after the blue ocean waters where nobody is there. And I love the fact that Zoom emerged from a red ocean market. And so this question is for all the founders that are in spaces where the VCs are saying um, that's an intensely crowded space, or um, if you make that feature, what would prevent Google or Microsoft just from copying you? Um, how do you know if in fact you should listen to yourself and not to the VCs? It sounds like it's you listen to your users and specifically when you listen to your users, was there a threshold in your mind about what you were looking for to know that this was not just good, but a great opportunity? Is it just if the users say, you know, did you measure that in any way or was it more just a feeling? You are so right. I think two things. First of all, you are so right. You know, listen to in the user. That's number one. Number two, in terms of a size uh, opportunity of the market, that's really hard, right? You, I do not think you have a formula to say, hey, this is big, that is small. You know, quite often, you know, take a Uber, for example. When it started, everyone thought that's a small niche market. It turned out a huge market, right? I think that when Google and started, they already, already have a Yahoo, right? I think you start from listening to end user, plus, I think that sometimes in terms of uh, opportunity, when you start, you do not know how big it is, right? However, in the future might be bigger and bigger. I think as long as you can you know, have a solution and plus you have a, a vision, you can build something better than others and you know, care, you know, essentially deliver a unique value with some of the users, at least you can survive, right? Don't always think about, hey, I have to enter into a market. It's a huge market. It's not like that I, for every business, I think. So you didn't go in having this vision that this was going to be the $150 billion phenomenon that it is. That was, you didn't need that, just to be enough. clear. I think huh? one billion is good enough. That's one billion good enough. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can survive. I, seriously, even yeah. today, I never think about, by the way, last week, I just had a, our user conference. That's what I learned from a, a media CEO co-founder, Jason Huang. Mm -hmm. I don't look at the score, you know, focus on the game, right? So don't look at the, the, the big potential market. Think about how you can survive, keep serving your customers. Along the way, you might find other opportunity. To start with, always start from very, very small. I think Sandy knows that. I always talk about in our board meeting, how we can survive as a company, how we can survive. We never think about the bigger things, so. I love that, that idea of focusing just on survival and, and focusing on, you know, thinking about what could kill you and then just how, and, and, and chasing that. Um, I want to get, get that really clear though. So for people, because if people are in situations where in that market, where everybody is telling you, you know, we don't need another video conferencing technology platform. Was there a practice that you used to center yourself to, to, to focus on? Did you use like a dashboard of saying, you know, I'm just going to be focusing on this metric and that's what I'm going to um, sense uh, my sense of confidence in is just if we're performing on this one or two, um, these two metrics, or did you use something else to center your attention and focus on uh, to, to, to zone out all the other naysayers that were giving you all this other feedback? I think for now, for sure, we have, uh, I think, uh, a list of the very important, you know, metrics in terms of like, uses, financial metrics, a lot. But early on, and when we started Zoom, there's no any metrics. The only metrics I have is when I talk with a user, how do you like Zoom? When a, a paid user cancel the service, I was sending them a personal email, why did you cancel our service? What we can do differently, right? Sometimes when the users, oh, I canceled because I'm gonna travel next two months, I may not use that, I do like your service, I will come back. When we get a, got more and more feedback like that, I feel like we are onto the right direction. And the did you measure that quantitative? Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's hard. I do not. We, we don't. There's no way for us to measure that. So. so you didn't use a net promoter score or some other equivalent score. You just, every time somebody was said, no, that's what you focused on is why you said, why did you leave? No, I think of four years, maybe five years after we long, you know, after we started the company, back in 2015 or 16, we do use uh, MPS score. Okay. But prior to that, I think, uh, you know, we, we really do not have anything to measure that. And you didn't have a North Star metric then. It was just you, this, this, this ethic of just focusing on the users. Okay. Yep. I love your story, Eric, even more so because you didn't not only started um, Zoom in a crowded market, you also overcame, and maybe that wasn't even caught, you weren't conscious about it, but that you, you had all these um, elements that are fears that prevent other um, students from becoming founders in the sense that you were an 
you had an engineering background. You had never been a CEO before. Um, you also were in your 40s with a very lucrative job um, at the time, and you convinced your family that, you know, I'm going to go jump this lucrative job and start something. You were an immigrant, and some founders have this sense that, you know, if they can't speak, if English is not their first language, that's a liability. And so I know we're not going to have enough time to go through all of that, but I want to start with the first thing, which is the engineering. As an engineer, um, was that at all in your mind? Were you, did you view that as an asset or a liability? starting Zoom as the CEO, having been a VP of engineering for the last two decades? For sure, it's not, it's not a liability. And so when you start something, you need to build a product, right? If you have an engineer background, at least you know how to build something, right? Also at the same time, if you have a, a business partner, like a co-founder, you know, to help you, to accompany you, that'd be great. Or you know, if you also have uh, interest, right, about the business model or sales or go to market, even do not need to have a co-founder, right? I think, uh, again, you know, you have engineer background, it's always a good thing, right? It's always a good thing. So it's I just want that message to get clear. Yeah. yeah. And how do you spend a typical day today? And is it different than how you spent a typical day when you started? Um, and what I'm wondering is, are you still involved deeply on the engineering side today as you were when you began? That's a great question. Interesting enough, if you ask me this question nine months ago, I will have a different answer. For now, I think that today, the way I live every day, exactly the same as 2011. You know, sleep, eat, Zoom. That's it. No, for now, the Zoom is more like a developer Zoom. For now, it's more like I'm using Zoom, right? So for the first several years, sleep, eat, and a developer product. That's it. Nothing else. For now, also something similar. So. But right now, how much of your time is spent in, on engineering in Zoom and how much of it is it spent on business? I think probably around the 20 or 25 percent on engineer now and 75 percent on something else. But it used to be 80 percent or 85 percent on engineering. It was on engineering. And, um, and so for the engineers that are going to become CEOs for the first time, do you have any practical tips or key pieces of advice that have been really helpful for you as you now are shifting more of your time on the business side and less on the engineering side that you wish you knew earlier? I think if you have an engineer background, you want to start a company, send you also in the call for sure. He's, he would like to find you, right? So, <laughs> you know, a lot of VCs like Sandy, you know, they like to find, you know, you know support those uh, entrepreneurs with uh, engineer, you know, background. Again, I think uh, to have engineering background is great. It is a plus. I think the only thing is you got to you know, think about it. Do you like, you know, like uh, sales or, or, or marketing or other things or not? You do, you can do it by yourself. If you don't like, like that, find a, a, a co-founder. You really trust, you can work it together well. I think it's uh, something similar to a lot of other startup companies in the Silicon Valley, you have two to three co-founders, right? I think you can start. Uh, again, you know, don't worry about like a go to market, a business model or sales marketing. You can always learn, right? Because you know you have time, right? You know, get a book to learn Silicon Valley. There's so many great, you know, VCs, great entrepreneurs, successful leaders. They can help you out. You don't worry about it. Nobody is very well prepared when they start a something. You always start from one thing. It's good enough. I think that's great advice. Everybody has certain trade-offs, gang. So everybody has this feeling that they're not complete, but that's that that is normal. You just have to know what you don't like and 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 get that handled um, uh, in in some way. And Eric, I understand that also. You sometimes bring around a a, a, a stack of books when you're working in different spots, or, or maybe pre-COVID, and you hand these books out to employees and others. Are there, if you had to hand out any books to the aspiring founders, especially maybe the former engineers who are going to become CEOs, are there any books that you would recommend they read? For sure. I think at Zoom, the one thing is we always reimburse any books you buy for yourself, for your family, because this is our company, the mentor, you know, to, to, to promote employees and reading a book. I think at Zoom, you know, trust is everything. There's no trust and no speed. I think the, the favorite book, you know, for Zoom is uh, The Speed of Trust. The author is uh, Stephen Covey. I think this is a great book. Uh, however, there's a lot of other books, right? You know, like, uh, you know, the, the hardest thing about the hardest things, you know, as, as a lot of a great book, right? Any book can help. you. Okay, that's great. One more question, Eric, then I'm going to move to Santi, which is um, on um, when you left 
you were making a lot of money um, as the VP of engineering at WebEx. You had you have three kids, you have a, a, a wife, you have a lucrative job, you're managing 800 people, you have all this prestige. How did you convince um, your wife and your family and, and also your, um, and yourself to take the leap? So yeah, you are you you are so right. Actually, you know, time flies. I still remember the moment. You know, Cisco is a great company, and being a corporate vice president, you know, they pay you very well. I think it's very. I never tried to convince myself. I knew that's my dream because I live in Silicon Valley. I call that a startup valley. Right? I knew someday I I will start a company. I think back then that's the best time. But to convince you know your family member like my wife, you are so right. It's not that easy. I still remember what my, my what my wife told me that, what you have a great job at Cisco, right? And they pay you very well. You want to start over from a, from a, the growing up to build something, you know. She had all kinds of questions. No way for me to have a good answer. <laughs> so, but again, you got to you know trust your your feeling. And uh, yeah, I was already forty one years old at that time. I also told her. If I want to try, it is winning time. You know, otherwise soon I may not have uh, enough energy, right? So, and uh, yeah, anyway, that's how it started. It's, it's, it's not that straightforward, and, but you got to move forward, even if you cannot convince others. Okay. I'm going to move to Santi now. Um, and Santi, uh, the, I, I want to ask you about what you saw. Obviously, I think Zoom obviously is something that, 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 that took off. We'll talk about that in a second. But I think another common thread between Eric and you is that you're both immigrants. You both were born and raised in countries outside of the United States, and you came to the U.S. Um, and Santi, so gang, I know Santi personally, and Santi is actually the first Latin VC that I think I ever knew. And I don't know if Santi, you are the first Latin VC, maybe the first GP at a, at a major fund. Um, but, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if that's the case, can you share a bit about that path and that journey into venture capital? What was it like coming as an, you know, as an, as a Latin person into venture capital on the early, in the, uh, how did you, how did that, how did that adventure and, and what was that path like? Yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you for having me. It's always great whenever I'm chatting with Eric or you, Ravi, just makes my day. I get a lot of energy. So I appreciate you having me here. And there are there are other Latin VCs out there that are doing really well. Um, for me, it wasn't as, it wasn't straightforward. And I tell people when when Eric started Zoom, a lot of people told him VC video conference there's no room for another video conferencing uh, company. They told me the same thing when I moved here 10 years ago. I remember I had an Excel spreadsheet where I was tracking all the VCs that I was talking to. I had 77 VCs that I was talking to. And the majority very well-known VCs would tell me that there were no Latinos in venture. So again, VC is not for you. You should go and try something else. It's like, go look for a different job. And, and that made me scratch my head. It's like, what is it? Is it that we don't have the gene uh, or something that's going to prevent us from getting into venture? And I actually got a lot of energy from that because it made me work harder to prove that I, I, mean, that I could do it. It's like, if you have an obsession with something, that irrational passion that Eric had when he wanted to solve this problem, that's, you need to keep on trying. And eventually you're going to find the people who believe not in your skills, but believe in you. And, and I had those people in my life who believed in me and gave me that opportunity. And I'm eternally grateful for that. Another, I mean, Alex Mendes from Storm Ventures, he was the first one to give me a job in venture. He said, we don't have a job, but we'll allow you to stop by and learn. And thanks to that offer, I was able to learn and get into this. So uh, again, I like when people tell me it can't be done because it just makes me work harder. Well, I think that is like the canonical experience of entrepreneurship is when the external world is telling you something, but you have some internal conviction and you have to choose or you have to decide which one you listen to and knowing when to listen to the outside and when to not listen to the outside and to, to beat your drum even louder um, to make sure that, 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 that it's being heard. And I think that, that that gets to the essence of it. Can you speak to then how, when Eric came to you for Zoom 
And you can speak to where he was at at that journey. I don't know if you were courting him or if he was courting you. Um, but um, one, <laughs> but if you either way, how did you how did you succeed in that pursuit? Um, how did you one um, because um, uh, if you want, you can speak to how intensely competitive the market was and why and or how was Zoom able to get its financing? Because I think there are some students that are asking that question. How do you get your first investors? Santi, I don't think was the first, but even Santi later, how did you then um, win the um, getting into Zoom if it was it was on the rise? Yeah, I mean, I'll tell my side of the story and then I'd love to hear Eric's take, but I courted him and I courted him because I was one of those frustrated users. Being from Argentina, I have a lot of friends and family there. Nothing worked for me when I wanted to stay in touch. I could call them and I could get like a family recipe or something, but I couldn't build a relationship because technology didn't work. My wife worked and lived in Nairobi, Kenya for a while. And again, to stay in touch, it was really hard. And this is gonna date me, but I was using those scratch cards to communicate with her. And it was really painful. And I felt that our relationship was getting weaker and weaker because we couldn't do this. We couldn't look at each other in the eyes and see how people were reacting. So I had that, that need myself. And that's why I've been trying every technology out there for this for a long time before I came across Zoom. And I came across Zoom back in 2013. So it was early in the journey of, of, of Zoom. And I remember testing it with my aunt in Argentina. She didn't speak English. She, I mean, she didn't own a computer or anything. And she downloaded the app to her phone and we were Zooming and it worked consistently. And that's when I realized that the product was doing something different and it changed my life early on. And then when I met Eric, I mean, the, the whole relationship went to a completely different level. It was less about the product, the metrics, the market, and it was more about Eric. Uh, and at the end of the day, I don't think that I invested in Zoom the company or Zoom the metrics or Zoom the video conferencing uh, market. I partnered with Eric because I connected with him and I, mean, I could see me, myself working with him for a very long time and becoming great friends. And, and that's, I mean, that and, was- and what, Oh, sorry. And what made Eric stand out? Because there are a lot of engineers that start companies. There were a lot of video conferencing companies at the time. And I'm asking this because the students are asking about how you got your first investment. And, how, and, and then it's, there is this consistent question around how do, you ha, how do you get a VC to actually give you money? Um, and Santi, you are a VC. You see thousands of pitches. What yeah. was it about Eric that made him great and not just good, whereas the other founders- may seem good and not great. Yeah, I don't think there's a one size fits all. There are some investors who are looking for the metrics, some investors who are looking uh, for the market. I'm looking for the people. And when I met Eric, he didn't have a pitch. Uh, when I visited him in the San Jose office, he would come down and greet me and walk with me up the stairs and they found out that the elevator never worked. And that's why he wanted to guide me into the right office. I mean, there were a bunch of dispersed offices in, the, in that building, but he had the human side of the entrepreneur who was doing Zoom for the right reasons. It wasn't about, I want TechCrunch to write about me. It wasn't about, I want to get the highest valuation. It, it was, there's a problem here that I need to fix and I'm not going to stop until I fix it. And we see a lot of entrepreneurs that are starting companies just because all my friends are starting companies. It's so cool. I'm going to do it. And those entrepreneurs end up giving up when things get tough. And things get tough in the life of a company. It doesn't matter if you're small or if you're big. But if you're passionate and obsessed with addressing that problem and that end customer, then you're going to run through walls. You're going to make things happen. And like Eric, I mean, Eric is working very long hours. And he's been working very long hours for a long time. It's not just now. And, and that's because he believes in what he's doing and his team believes in him and he feels and he knows he owes this to every stakeholder, not just shareholders, but customers, employees, the community, the world. And when you find someone like that, 
it's, I mean, it's once in a lifetime. Um, yeah. That's great. And Eric, can you comment on how, what it's like to be an entrepreneur right now at your stage? Because it's rare for us to get a CEO founder who's at this stage in terms of, you know, Santi was saying how, how, how you're still working hard hours. I, don't, I know Eric doesn't like to think about the money, but the, you know, Zoom is valued at $150 billion. You're one of the wealthier people in the world now. Um, you, you know, you have more, you don't need to work. Um, but what is a day in your life like? Like how many hours do you work every day? Is it a stressful life? Um, is it, is, is it less fun now than it was at the beginning or is it more fun now than it was at the beginning? Or I think points? it's given that in the audience, a lot of, um, Stanford. So last week and we held our uh, annual user conference in Zoomtopia. I invited a co-founder and a CEO of NVIDIA, Jensen Huang, right? I had a similar questions. This is what he told me that is his quote, right? I love the my work. I love the purpose of my work. I enjoy working hard. Remember, he started a company back in 1993. Look at what he did. Look at what NVIDIA changed yeah. entire industry, right? I think he is our role model. You know, having cited that, I think, uh, you know, so many great other entrepreneurs, right? They all want to work hard because they really enjoy working hard. They feel like this is a great opportunity, right? to help to, change, to make the world a better place. Otherwise, you know, fast forward 20 or 30 years later, when you look back, you will say, oh, I regret. I had all the energy back then. I did not do the right thing, right? I think if you enjoy in building up something, enjoy the work, you do not feel tired, right? If anything else is secondary. How you can build something to help, to help the world. I think that's where I think uh, the sustainable and you might be enjoying doing that. And is it, when has it been the most enjoyable at Zoom? Is there a certain phase of Zoom in the last nine years that was the most enjoyable? Every day the same. Every day the same. And how many hours are you working every day? Uh, it's, it really depends, right? And back in April or uh, March, I had more uh, sleepless nights than any time in my career. You know, I think every day is different. I think a big day back in April, I had a total of 19 Zoom meetings. And I do not think that's work, seriously. I really don't think that's work. I just enjoy that. You think that's my life, but this is work. You know, I, I, I did not see any difference. But, but Eric, you not only built an amazing product, but you also built an amazing product during this tsunami of a time um, in the world when COVID hit. And so in March and in April, when COVID was becoming, it was clear that this was gonna become the new normal and this pandemic was spreading. Can you tell us what it was like um, inside of Zoom at that time or what it was like to be the CEO? As I mentioned, right, I added a more sleepless nights, right? It's not that easy. On the one hand, you know, every employee at Zoom, we were very excited. <laughs> you feel like many years of hard work finally is well, well paid off. Even my kids at the school, they can use Zoom for online classes. Your neighbor can talk about the use Zoom for like a happy hour or for online yoga class. So you're very excited from that perspective. Also at the same time, guess what? You know, you have to right, work harder, right? Because the users, you know, uh, came from all over the world. You have to add a capacity. You got to embrace a lot of new use cases, you know, privacy challenges for consumers. They are very different user base, user base. And plus, you know, and you know, you need to make sure your internal process not broken, right? And uh, you know, it's, it's not that easy behind the scenes. But the good news, our in investment on the company culture and value, you know, in this critical time, looking back, I think this is something I think we, I feel very proud. Yeah. No employees that assume many complain. They all worked very hard. They all wanted to leverage this opportunity be, to help the Zoom to become a better company and to have people stay connected. That's great. I'm going to turn to the student. So I've been asking some questions, but I'm going to go explicitly to the student questions. The most popular question right now is people want to know how you think Zoom will be affected when we finally get through COVID and the, st and the world starts to come back to normal. Is that something that you think about and any, any, any thoughts on that? We do. We go, first of all, I hope that hopefully this uh, crisis it can be over very soon. It's not really easy. We all work from home for such a long time, mental health, depression. I think even after the pandemic crisis is over, I truly believe the hybrid 
you know, work, uh, uh, you know, a place will be the future, right? So meaning, you know, even if we all go back to you know, office to work, we're likely, you know, we probably send employees back at home one day or two days a week. I think the way for us, you know, to leverage the tools like Zoom will stay. I'm not seeing the, the, the usage like today, right? However, the tools like this will help. It's not as we think about what we can innovate, you know, what if we can embrace new use cases? That's okay. We do not worry about, oh, uses might decline. That's not important for us. Well, that's interesting. So you're not measuring based on whether or not users are going to decline or not. You're, what, what, and then what are you measuring? Is it just... Um, we, again, yeah. you know, our goal is to truly deliver happiness to our I, customers. Right? So I love... Yeah. Yeah, because customers send other feedback. Take this online class, for example. Universities, they see a lot of them using Zoom. At the same time, they share the feedback. Can you have this feature, that feature? Then we think about, maybe you should have a different user interface, right? And also a lot of uh, Zoom hosts, they say, like an online yoga class teacher, you know, what can we do, right, to have those people more, host them more? Meaning, you know, we can add the, the payment feature embedded into Zoom. And also can have those meeting hosts to, you know, uh, to publish their events, right? I think a lot of things can be done you know, to serve those users as well. That's our focus. And is there a dashboard now that, is there, is there a North Star metric that's guiding you? Because this is in some sense a chaotic time as well. Even when you were starting, it was intensely competitive and you had to zone things out. Now it's also sort of crazy in a different way. Is there an, a compass of a dashboard or a metric? And I know you, it is the users, but is there something specifically that you use to measure or to track your progress Against is there a number I think on, on financial front? We do have some metrics because we are a public company, right? We yeah. need to report back to send you to the board of the Wall Street. That's very important. But a behind the scenes, I really do not like it's just a metrics driven company, right? Okay. You got otherwise, you, 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 there's no innovation. We got to think about one metric, maybe just the NPS score. That's really important, right? Okay. And another metrics. What we can do is spend more time with customers, with users, listen to their feedback, come back, come back work as hard as, as we can to come up with the solutions ahead of any of other vendors, right? That's the most important matrix. With that, you will have a lot of ideas coming from your employees if you spend more time to interact with your users. That's great. We have a question from one of the students. Andrew wants to know what are strategies to deal with competitors backed like by massive companies like Alphabet. You now have a big target on your on your back from uh, the big trillion dollar companies. How do you compete? No strategy. <laughs> Why do you look at the competitors? I can, as I mentioned many times, if I look at the competitors, I even do not dare to start a Zoom. If I look at a competitor every day, I cannot sleep. There's already so many things that keep him up in the night. If I always look at a competitor, seriously, I even cannot sleep well. Spend more time talking with your customers and users. That's the key. Don't think about competitors. What if your competitors, they are making mistakes? Are you going to copy what they are doing? Right? <laughs> Plus, a lot of bigger competitors, that's not their focus either, right? Again, if you always look at competitors, that's another reason why so many smart people, they, they cannot start something. Look at in the user, look at the consumer, and look at all your customers or partners. Don't get, look at the competitors. I think that's great. Yeah, and you know, we do live in this tech crunch uh, culture where we glorify these trillion dollar companies and these huge raises and these huge valuations, but we don't spend enough time oftentimes talking about the struggles that um, are part of the unicorn journey. Um, and there's a question here about that, that, that question about becoming a unicorn, but is there, is there, can you guys share a hard time um, uh, or a, a, a hard situation that you were wrestling with, whatever you can share publicly and how you got through that in the journey of building Zoom? Yeah, yeah Sandy, feel free to tell me. I think over the past several years, from time to time, we always struggled on, on many things, on many fronts. You know, early on, as a mission, right, it's really hard, you know, to raise capital, right? That's, that's probably the first struggle. And the second thing, you know, after you have a team, right, you know, start up with a long journey, right? How can you make sure everyone, you know, they are patient, right, to keep delivering happiness to customers? It's, you know, it's also, you know, we, we had to 
you know, convince those, uh, especially for the, the young employees, right? I think at a different time and uh, we have a different struggles. Uh, again, even recently, right, we also have all kinds of, uh, I think, uh, the, the things we need to worry, right? You know, it's kind of, a, but, you, but you enjoy that. So that's okay. So. I, I can talk about another struggle that I had with Zoom. And I ended up learning a lot with Eric. Uh, in this like Silicon Valley where everyone's starting companies, there's always this expectation that as you grow the company, you're gonna be hiring different executives from other companies who've done this, been there, they have the credibility. And that seems to be the playbook. You start a company in the enterprise sector, you wanna hire people from Salesforce, you wanna hire people from Bob, you wanna hire people from ServiceNow? And, and I came in with that mindset into Zoom. And Eric taught me that there's another way to build great companies. And the way Zoom built an incredible team is by bringing in people who worked incredibly hard and who were passionate like Eric was when he started the company. They were not doing it for the title. For a very long time, we didn't have C-level executives at Zoom. They were all head off. Even until the company went public, it was like the head of marketing and Janine was running everything. She would have been like a, like a CMO at any other company, but she didn't care about that. She cared about Zoom. And Eric gave the right people the right opportunity and these people delivered incredibly well and they were able to grow with the company and they are still adding a lot of value. And for me, that was a great lesson but I struggled initially because I felt that everyone else was hiring the who's who and we were not, but we were hiring the right people. Can you guys speak a little bit more to that? Because it feels like that is something that's very unique and novel uh, uh, for, this, for the journey and success of Zoom is, is that both in funding Eric, it was a people-driven decision. That wasn't, uh, uh, and then also Eric, in the culture that you've built, it's been focused, it sounds like, on the, the qualities of the individuals more than their resumes or their backgrounds. And so can you speak to how, um, are any, any key tactics that you've done to create this culture where people want to work hard for you? Or how do you identify those people that will be outperformers um, if you can't look at their resumes and their backgrounds and what they've done in the past? Yeah, so Ravi, that's a great question. Uh, thank you, thank you for sharing that. That's exactly the our you know, tactics. The reason why is you know, for any startup companies, it's a long journey, right? You really cannot think about two or three or four or five years, you can achieve something. When we started Zoom 2011, our first sort of the milestone in terms of we think it'd be success is 10 years, right? It's a long journey. By doing that a journey, if you hire someone is great background in you know, already very successful in other companies, do you think they are going to stay with you for like another 10 years? You know, our tactics is more like, we want to you know, hire those people with a greater potential. They want to learn, right? also self-motivated. Ideal the scenario would be everyone at Zoom, myself included, we can grow ourselves to the next level. We can become a better version of ourselves along with the company growth. Guess what? Those employees, they tend to be very loyal. Right? That's really important, right? Otherwise, is within a long journey, four or five years later, some employees, especially you know, successful and in other companies, or four or five years, I still do not see anything. They might have quit. You don't want to have those employees. You know, that's why, you know, even you set up a straight goal, right? Promote someone may, may not be ready, but as long as they want to learn, I think that should be okay. That's our you know philosophy. But anyway, I'm not saying that is perfect, right? So it's also full of challenges. Like suddenly you have a pandemic crisis. Guess what? Our leaders, myself included, all employees, they cannot grow themselves, right? With 30 times more traffic. Then you probably looking back and say, ah, you should have hired someone who did that before, right? Again, this is also learning curve for us as well. Okay. We have a question about work-life balance. You both have kids. You both have amazing careers. Um, Eric, you were just telling us about how it's, you're working st even still harder now, um, uh, uh, e even though Zoom has had all the successes that it has. Um, how do you do that? And do you have to sacrifice your personal lives? And if not, what's the secret? 
Sandy, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, um, I, I don't believe that much in work-life balance. I believe in loving your job. And if you love your job, then everything is more fluid. I mean, I'm working like Saturday, Sundays at night during the day. Now I get to see my kids a lot because I'm at home. And I never think about I'm going to work from nine to five and then see my kids. I love doing what I do. I mean, I love doing this. I love working with the entrepreneurs. I love helping them build their companies and sharing what we've seen in the past. Um, so I feel that if I need to start thinking about work-life balance, something that I'm doing is wrong. I'm not doing the job that I should be doing. Yeah, I, I think I sent you right on. That's right. See, it's Rev, you see that Sandy and I have a greater chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was young, also, I also had a similar questions. Every time, you know, when I talk to other leaders, you know, or maybe my mentors, I always ask, how do you balance your work life? You know, finally, I realized as long as I think about a balance, that's the wrong direction. There's no way to balance between work and life. you got to find your passion, the work in life, life your work, you got to enjoy that. Then if there's a conflict between the work and your family and the life, guess what? Family first, that's it. So that's also, we, we, we talk about a lot at Zoom, right? You know, you got to enjoy what you're doing, doing a single balance. If there's conflict, always focus on your, your family. That's a priority. Yeah, I think that's, that's it's, a, it's a great way of, of looking at it. And I think also if you, following your passion, it's energizing and you're, you're better to everybody around you when you're energized as well. Um, terrific. We have a question here around, um, for Santi around uh, barriers to being a Latin VC due to stigma or prejudice. Do you feel like there's prejudice or, st or stigma uh, and, and where is it from? Is it, if, if it does exist? Uh, I do think it still exists. Initially, uh, it bothered me a lot, but there's a lot that I can't control. So now I don't even pay attention to that. I remember at first people were inviting me to like football games and not my football. It's like a different football. It's the American football. My football is soccer. And I was like, okay, this is not my thing. But I felt that I had to go. Now, I, I just don't do that. I, I am who I am. And I embrace who I am. And to be honest, I feel that I was lucky to meet Eric and be part of this story because of my different background. After we invested, I tried to introduce Eric to other VCs. They wouldn't even take the meeting. Because again, it's video conference, it's like it's done, but I could see that. So I believe that we, we all need to embrace who we are and those differences are gonna make us better and happier. Um, and then what you can't control, just let go. It's like the competition question. It's like, why focus on the competition? Why focus on what people are saying? Just focus on what you can control. And so is your advice, if, if somebody else is facing, um discrimination or stigma to try to convince those people that are giving him or her the discrimination to convince them that they're wrong or just to uh, let them go and so, find the ones that listen? So discrimination comes at different levels. So it depends on, uh, on, on what type of discrimination people are going through. But in my case, when people told me Latinos can't get into venture, they, they, they don't do that. I just found the people who believed that it doesn't matter if you're from Latin America, from Europe, from like Asia. It's like they get to know you as a person and they get past the accent and you find those people. And I found those people. And there are a lot of people, this, I mean, Silicon Valley is so diverse. You have people from all over the world. Um, so just find the people that you wanna hang out with. Eric, do you, did you have any fear about stigma as with English as your second language? I actually know a lot of students and founders that actually have that as a real fear and they don't start a company or become CEO because they think that their English is, is, is not as good as a native born um, English speaker. Was that at all in your mind or is that even a concern that people should think about? Not at all, no fear at all. Because let's, let's, what a thing you, you know, cited right now, right? There are so many good people, good entrepreneurs, leaders in Silicon Valley. I think that nobody is perfect. Everyone has the strengths and a weakness, right? And why you need to have so many fears, right? Focus on your strengths, right? And focus on passion. And fear will not help you anything, right? It's just that know your weakness, have a plan to improve. 
and enjoy that. I think uh, that's that's what to do. If you're perfect, you 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 are not even to have a courage, right, to do a lot of things, right. That's one of the reasons you got to work harder, right, to keep improving, to become a better version of yourself. Fear will not help. I love this lesson. I'm just putting attention on purpose and passion. We're going to end gang with just any final comments that you want to share to your 20, to yourselves when you were 20 years old. So if you took yourself back to when you were 20, um, is there any advice that you would want to have imparted to your 20 year old self? Yeah. So Santi, if you, if you do not mind, maybe I can start. I think two things I can tend, if I can, I can tell the 20 of any word of myself is, Ideally, I, I should know the purpose of life earlier. The earlier I understood the purpose of life, the better for many things. Otherwise, looking back, I just wasted a lot of time, energy on a lot of things. Looking back, it's stupid. And this is the first thing. The second thing is, as long as you have a dream, right? You know, I think just, just do it, right? The neck is uh, mental, just do it. I think this is very important. And even if you're not ready, just do it. You can learn a lot on that journey. Thank you, Eric. Santi? Two things as well for me. One of them is I would have spent more time with my parents. Both, both of them passed away uh, when I was young. And I think I took them for granted uh, growing up. And so that's what I encourage people to do, spend time with their family because you never know what's going to happen. And the second thing, I would have moved to Silicon Valley earlier uh, without taking so many detours. And I ended up getting here as one of those journeys, you don't know where you're going to go. But had I known Silicon Valley existed, I, I should have moved here earlier because this is, this is where I find the people that just inspire me to learn. And every day I learn something new. And when I learn, my kids know it. They feel that I'm energized. So after this call, I'm going to be like having dinner with them and I'm going to be like super excited and they'll know that I had a great call. That's great. Well, thank you both. I think we all had a great call. I think we're all energized. So thank you, Eric. Thank you, Santi. On behalf of STVVP, the students and the public YouTube community, thank you. I'm, there's, there's lots of virtual Zoom love for you guys, uh, but everybody's on mute right now, so you won't be able to feel it. Uh, but thank you, guys. That was great. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.